today uh, it's uh, rather special. Uh, we have got somebody uh, like uh, Mr. Shukuru Bakshi who is here, uh, of course for his uh, mind tree fame, but besides that uh, a great business author, as he says a non-fictional writer, uh, who we are really, really eager to listen from this afternoon. And uh, uh, talking to him today is going to be the young and bright Gandha Bray. Uh, and um, uh, he is uh, going to pursue his uh, MBA in NC France uh, shortly after his uh, four year stint in Kolkata. And uh, of course, uh, it is going to be a very, very interesting uh, uh, you know, uh, session, I'm sure. Uh, just for those who are new to this author afternoon, uh, I must reiterate that uh, this is, a, this is a, an endeavor of the Prabha Khaitan Foundation. And uh, we are in partnership with uh, T2 of the Telegraph and Sri Simens, and of course, uh, Taj Bengal. Very proud to host this afternoon for you. So we look forward to a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Samrat. Well, Mr. Bakshi, thank you for being here. Call me Shubrata, you make me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Shubrata, thank you for being here. Um, I'm sure you've been very busy now with um, the new foundation work. But just to get back, uh, well, to start, to start off, um, you've been a very prolific writer, right? And uh, <coughs> The first question I'd have is, how, you, how do you have the time for it? <laughs> well, you know, as I, as I was telling a little earlier, uh, that that's the question that I get asked most often, where do you find the time to write? And my usual answer is that I don't play golf. Uh, so, uh, you know, writing is, uh, is a little like painting. And I look, my, look at my work as, uh, as, as uh, work which entails painting with words. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, painting or if you look at music for that matter, it requires uh, staying with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot be seasonally uh, engaging with painting or music. So you have to give, uh, if this is your calling and this is your gift, then you have to give it time. Uh, there's no other way. Uh, it will stay with you. Uh, and uh, I have began to realize that, you know, so you have your work, you know, that brings the paycheck. Of course. And you have the customer demands and the demands from your fellow workers and uh, the day-to-day -day issues and so on. So uh, within that framework, and all of us have 16-hour professional lives, mm -hmm. within that framework for you to then give time to whatever that, um, that's your passion. Uh, the, the question is, uh, you know, where do you find that? And for me, uh, the refrain is that if you find a passion, mm -hmm. time will find you. Okay. Fair enough. So the, the challenge really is to find where's your passion. So if you, you know, want to write, you want to compose music, you want mm -hmm. to practice your veena or whatever instrument that you play, you will wake up at 4, four o'clock in the morning and do it and you will feel absolutely fresh with four hours, five hours sleep. And a very bountiful thing that happens to someone like me who is essentially a businessman is that you have to travel, which means that you have to fly, which means that you are trapped in an aircraft. Um, and uh, so what do you do, particularly if you're flying a transatlantic plane and you have 21 hours of flying ahead of you, so how much wine can you drink and how That's much uh, loose talk, I mean small talk, not loose talk, <laughs> small talk can you have with your fellow passengers, so you get the time. You know? Definitely. So uh, time has never been a constraint, thank you so much. Thank you. Has never been a constraint. Mm -hmm. But I must also tell you and I must acknowledge presence of Sushmita here, uh, who's uh, been a companion, wife, um, you know. Uh, so we we have uh, we married very early, and she comes from a publishing family, and she herself is a writer and more uh, a deeper writer than me because she writes fiction. So having a husband and wife writing under the same roof is especially advantageous because um, no one feels neglected. Mm -hmm. She would come home and uh, after a, you know, five, six, uh, let's say sometimes weeks of travel and you come back and you feel like writing. Um, so the, uh, the uh, 
other partner is not, uh, uh, the other partner is actually happy about it. It's not complaining that you come after so long and you start, to, you know, hitting your keyboard. And I feel the same way. When she writes, uh, I'm ec ecstatic, I'm very happy for her. So we make space for each other. And that helps, actually. If that wasn't the case, if, if the partner grudges, um, because when you, you, when you write, you are, uh, you are into it, and you are, uh, even if you are writing fiction, uh, non-fiction, you will, you know, I can assure you, are as much into it, and you are in that world of, uh, world of uh, another universe, so to oh, speak. Yeah. I'm sure you, you, you know, you spend a lot of time dredging up. If you're writing non-fiction and from your own, his, from your own reco recollection, spend a lot of time, you know, getting back into the past, trying to collect your thoughts, you know, before you go and finally put it down on paper. Um, well, yeah, you, you are right, because uh, in, you know, in, in my world particularly, I think sometimes ideas and thoughts take a long time to germinate. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I wrote my book, The Professional, actually the, uh, the germination took place during my very first visit to the United States in 1990. And it was a, uh, it was, it was a culture shock is not the right word, but whatever it is. You know, I, I have been a professional in India, and I know right. the corporate world here, the business world here. Then I go there in 1990 to the Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different world. And when I went there, I realized that the, the ultimate professional in the U U.S. or a developed country and that person's counterpart here, they're equally good. So if yeah. you are a neurosurgeon in India, you are a teacher in India. Um, you are a uh, you know, civil engineer in India and you are within the top 5%. Mm -hmm. uh, you are world class. You could be top 5% anywhere in the world. But there's a big gap between their average and our average. Their average is way ahead of our average. So that thought kept on germinating in my mind that a country to be world class mm -hmm. requires its professionals to be world class. Right. And by the time I wrote the book, The Professional, it was almost 20 years after. And I was not even aware that I was seeping in, I was observing professionals mm -hmm. from a wide range of areas, uh, from uh, different parts of the world. And finally, I wrote the book after about 20 years. So is it fair to say that the, you have numerous ideas that have been germinating over decades? Because you have been one of the most prolific business authors of our time. And so well, I've just been sowing the seeds. Well, not sowing, I'm sorry, reaping your crop of uh, knowledge and information. Well, it sounds very flattering. But, I <laughs> but it's true. true. <laughs> it's, it's, quite, it's quite true. Um, what, like maybe eight books in the past yeah. eight, eight years? Must eight to nine years? Day, yeah. Which is quite a feat. Well, um, but, you know, it is uh, important not to count in terms of uh, how many number of books that you produce. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, uh, I'll use a very businessy uh, term here, you know, your input-output ratio must be right. So sometimes if your output is more than your input, <laughs> then it is uh, not a good thing. Yeah. And there has been a time when I uh, have uh, wanted to slow down. Mm -hmm. And it, particularly in the last 18 months, I have deliberately slowed down a little bit mm -hmm. um, so that uh, you are not overproducing. Mm -hmm. And you are, you're not writing for the sake of writing. Right. You know. Uh, so. Yeah. So, so I think the, the, the quality of what you write uh, is uh, far more important than how many books you put. You know. Absolutely. I hate to use the term, but... Uh, the term is produce, right? Produce, yes. So, so many uh, publishers would want to see, um, so e even before your first book has gone into print, your publisher comes and asks you, so when are you going to do the next book for us? And my refrain is, you know, I'm like a, a mother who's still in the nursing home, has just delivered, and you come and tell me, so when are you going to get pregnant again? <laughs> yeah. No, so, um, and just, just fin finally to come to round up um, the kind of work you've written, you said that um, once you find your passion, you find the time, right? No. If you find your passion, time finds you. 
Okay, fair, fair, fair enough. So, um, what, what, uh, so, so to speak, ignited your passion about writing in particular? See, um, when I look back in time, I see three distinct uh, phases of uh, realization mm -hmm. about writing. The first phase of realization is uh, knowing that, oh my God, you know, you can write. Okay, so it's it's almost like, um, you know, let's say you discover that you can sing. By the way, I cannot sing at all. So <laughs> I'm just uh, giving an example uh, for the for making it simpler. So, at what age? in your life did you first realize that I can sing, first realize that I can write, first realize that I can take a great picture. Mm -hmm. It's an aha moment, okay? It's a very joyful moment mm -hmm. and uh, it is a, uh, you know, you, you, you realize that you have been gifted, okay? It's not you, though you don't know at that point in time, but it's a gift. and. Uh, Typically, for a writer, it happens in, at a very young age, mm -hmm. in your teens, and you suddenly write something and people say, oh, you write so well. Right. Then you send it to, uh, when I was growing up, there used to be a magazine uh, called Your Times. So mm -hmm. you send it out and you get a small little letter from the editor saying your work has been accepted. And a few days after, you get a money order. Those were the days of money order. Okay, so uh, you get... Uh, you know, for a small little poem you wrote, you get 10 rupees. Maximum, I remember, I got 25 rupees. And there was a lot of money and a lot of adulation. And their friends tell, oh, you know, I read your piece in your times and your teachers talk to you. So that's a phase of discovery mm -hmm. and a phase of innocence and phase of joy. Mm -hmm. And then comes a second phase where it's a phase of uh, awareness, a deeper awareness, where it is not that you just, you know, you are you're writing for the joy of it, mm -hmm. but you are being um, touched by things around you, and then you go back, you reflect, and you write and think, and sometimes you think, and then you write. Whereas in the first phase, it's very impulsive, it's very right. raw, it is very intuitive. Mm -hmm. It's straight from, you don't even know whether it's from your gut or your head or wherever it is. So that second phase, which I experienced around the age of 30, the first phase was between, let's say 14 and uh, maybe 18. Mm -hmm. I did go through a period of barrenness when okay. I came into the professional world. Mm -hmm. And then when I, eventually entered the information technology industry because of its knowledge intensity and the kind of people that you meet, etc. It all came back. And then the second phase kicked in where you are touched by issues and, you know, the externalities of life and living. Then a third phase comes in, which happens yet later. That's a phase that happened to me about, uh, maybe about eight, nine years back, where you realize that what was in the phase one a gift, in the third phase becomes a responsibility. Okay. And then you realize that this gift was given to you for a reason. So I see that in my case, and as I uh, told you earlier, I'm a non-fiction writer, so that puts me at a plebeian level <laughs> compared to fiction writers. So for me, I see three very important uh, needs to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. One is, I think, uh, I write for people from B-class towns because I grew up in those mm -hmm. and there's an important need for us to give hope to you know people who are faceless, nameless in this country who need to believe that you know ordinary people can do extraordinary things. So there's a need to create hope. I think uh, creating hope is a leadership imperative. At the next level it is about creating capacity. Right. And at the third level which is very important in a country like India, we need to, we, we, we need to give a human face to business. Yeah. Uh, business has all kinds of connotations. And businessmen mm -hmm. have all 
kinds of connotation in this country. So we need to humanize. We need to make people believe that there is a, uh, there is a, uh, there's a positive angle to business. There's an important human angle to business. Mm -hmm. So keeping those three factors in mind, I said that it is not just important to build a mind tree or an Infosys or a house of Tata's or whatever. Uh, we need to actually build content around it and it is not easy. You can be a great doctor, but it right. is very difficult to be, to write something simple about how do you do your procedure so that more greater doctors can be created. Right. So as I grew up into the third phase, I realized that mm -hmm. I have twin responsibilities. One is to build a company like Mindtree, mm -hmm. which was what my life was a runway for looking back. Mm -hmm. But more than doing that, it is important to codify that, write about it, and write about things around it so that people can do bigger things. Right. So in a sense, partly you are uh, telling others that, look, it is possible. You can do it. Mm. Right? So I have gone through those three phases, and I'm currently in that phase where I believe that, you know, when you are gifted, uh, a time comes when it is a responsibility. Right. And uh, it's a very happy, it's a very loving responsibility. So at your, when, when you started Mindtree, I believe you started at a very senior leadership role, right? And um, one of, the, one of the, uh, your books, um, Elephant Catchers, talks about how you um, sought to grow the company you know, on, from a very nascent stage to really uh, playing with the big boys, so to speak. Um, in, in that respect, how did you, um, did, did you find like your, experience of being mentored or being inspired by um, you know yep. your past teachers mm -hmm. really helped in developing a culture because from what I've read about Mindtree at least there's a very strong focus on people mm -hmm. and being very value driven mm -hmm. so how do you find your do you, do you find your past experiences being channeled into into a business venture so to speak yeah absolutely you know it is uh you know, my mind keeps going back to this idea that if you have experienced affection um, early in your life, then you automatically want to give affection. Mm -hmm. And uh, so once you, uh, you, you realize the magic of uh, receiving, okay, call it mentorship, call it guidance, call it, uh, you know, apprenticeship, call it whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, once that happens, then, uh, you know, it's easy for you to, you know, institutionalize that. Yeah. And uh, Mindtree was, uh, was, was conceptualized um, as an organization which would be aspirational, mm -hmm. which should uh, create shared wealth, right. and uh, which, should be, uh, which should be an organization with a social concerns. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Businesses cannot succeed if societies fail. Absolutely. Okay. So when you look at those three uh, things, which became a shared vision for mm -hmm. the co-founders, we said it's absolutely difficult to create something like that without building an organization mm -hmm. that takes a fractal view of itself. Mm -hmm. That it is not a pyramidical, it is not the power of one, it has to be the power of many. Absolutely. And. Uh, so given that perspective, uh, for us it became then critical to, mm -hmm. to give a lot away so that a lot can be received. Mm -hmm. And then the power of the organization became very shared, fractal, and hence expansive. And so, so do you believe that um, at least most, if not each and every one of your employees has imbued that, those sense of values that you've sought to in, you know, instill the organization with? So first of all, we don't call our people employees. Okay. Uh, we call them mind to minds. You right, know, minds. Uh, mind to minds. So uh, we are we are sixteen thousand plus people today. Okay. And uh, I think um, the idea of uh, uh, the, the idea that you just talked about is something that is deeply ingrained in the organization. Okay. At least uh, you know we we were afraid that okay so. Uh, when you have a 50 people organization, you can ensure that. When you have right. a 500 people organization, you can ensure that. But will it hold good when you have 5,000 and 10,000, right. 16,000? Oh, 16, 16, so fortunately, it has held. And the challenge for leaders of Mindtree going forward 
would be to make sure that as the organization goes into its next orbit, to mm -hmm. make sure that those you know fundamental uh, values and principles stay intact, because you know that's very core to the organization. That's very core to who you are. Absolutely. But I think going back to your point, it is part of the organizational DNA. Mm -hmm. Like individuals, we have a DNA. Uh, right. Forget about the mission, vision, values, but there's a deep DNA. You may not every day, you know, scratch your skin to check if your DNA is intact or not, but your DNA is making you who you are. Um, so it has become part of the DNA. Right. And so then, um, after after your time as a CEO, I believe it was. Yeah. Uh, you moved on to a very unique role of gardener. Yeah. Um, so now I'm I'm not sure if that's something that every institution has, but could you actually go into more detail about what that yeah, is? So it's like this, you know, we went, uh, we started the company in 1999 after thinking through the idea for a year prior to that. So 1999 we started, 2007 mm -hmm. we took the company public. Mm -hmm. At the time of starting the company, we agreed between the founders a couple of things. One is that our children cannot work for the company. Mm -hmm. And second thing is that our spouses will have nothing to do with the company. Now, when you build that kind of a construct, then the issue is what happens to the company after you. Right. Uh, and we're 10 co-founders who started the mm -hmm. company. Now, when the first phase was over, which is when we took the company public in 2007, mm -hmm. then we began to think about capacity creation for the future. And we had a conversation among ourselves that, look, you know, 10 years, just went away in the blink of an eye, 1999 to 2007. Right. Then the mind started thinking about, so the company for the year 2020, mm -hmm. though it sounded a very, you know, it sounded like it was a long view of time, we had experienced how fast time can fly. In the early 2016. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So we said that how do we then create capacity for 2020 mm -hmm. that we, you know, we, we stay invested mm -hmm. full time into leadership creation. Right. And uh, we began to believe that you can't create leaders by sending people to a training program. No, you can't. Nor can you do leadership creation by what we call sheep dipping. In New Zealand, you take sheep and, you know, just put them in a vat of uh, uh, dyes and the sheep come out in the same color. <laughs> so, right or wrong, we said that leadership development is a very one-to-one -one thing. Right. So, we said, here is 2020. Mm -hmm. Here's the challenge of capacity creation, and none of our children will take the company from us. So, we have to create capacity in other people. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at leadership development as not a massification exercise, but as an act of one. If that be the case, then how do we actually make sure that there are 100 people mm -hmm. ready for taking the organization to the next level? Right. So if these 100 people are identified, then who is going to take on full-time responsibility? Mm -hmm. And I volunteered for it. Right. At that time, I was vice chairman of the company and the chief operating officer. And I said, I will work on it full-time. And uh, I had a condition to the board. I said, the condition is that this requires working in people's personal and professional space because, you know, organizational leadership and personal leadership are intertwined. Absolutely. You can't be a first-rate manager and a third-rate spouse at the same time. Okay, it doesn't work. And, you know, contrary to popular belief, uh, the, this, this porosity between our personal lives and professional lives. So this would require me to apply across this, and mm -hmm. the board had to assure that it will at no stage want to know from me about what happened. Right. So I quit the committees of the board, mm -hmm. and I said that the uh, human resource uh, function, which we call people function, will not ever ask me for something, but I can ask everything from them. Right. <laughs> so if I want to read somebody's personal file, I can read it. Right. Okay. But they cannot ask me what, can, what happened. Mm -hmm. So once that assurance was given, then I set about building a structured and a set of unstructured processes, mm -hmm. okay, partly art and science and partly witchcraft, if you will, and then began a long engagement process with the top 100 people in the company. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that went on for uh, almost uh, five years okay. until I became chairman, the executive chairman of the company when the lawyer said you cannot call yourself Gardner anymore. <laughs> uh, and when this whole idea was, you know, idea was uh, brought out, mm -hmm. I said that this cannot be an institutional role, right. including the title of it. Okay, mm -hmm. so people have to feel comfortable about the whole thing, but the intent and the process. So I sat down and said, so what, what do we call this person, uh, or, you know, or this role? And it wasn't difficult because we were mind tree and hence the, you know, it, it flowed very easily that this yeah. person should be a gardener. gardener. And somebody said chief gardener. I said, no, 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 not chief gardener because no chief gardener no, in no. no public garden works. Okay. <laughs> So you have to be a gardener. You have to. But this actually brought out, without any one of us realizing, brought mm -hmm. out the idea of servant leadership. OK. See, there's a difference between a farmer and a gardener. Mm -hmm. The farmer is dealing with crops. And one, uh, one blade of paddy and another blade of paddy at the same, at the same time. Okay. So it's all, it looks the same, it is treated the same way. Mm -hmm. It's planted at the same time, de-weeded at the same time, drained and irrigated at the same time. But that's not the way that if you go to the botanical garden here, mm -hmm. or anywhere for that matter, or you look at a small patch of garden, that's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. Every plant is unique. Right. You know, you cannot treat the java full and the belly full and the gola per gach uh, in the same way. Right. Uh, so the gardener, unlike the farmer, has to build a one-to-one -one relationship. Mm -hmm. With each flower. With each plant. They have different pruning needs. <laughs> okay. And uh, so it's, it, and the, the plants don't come to the gardener. The gardener mm -hmm. has to go to where the plant is. It is a massively fabulous uh, understanding for all of us because then we said, look, you know, I have to have the humility and the availability to go and interact with every leader mm -hmm. in her time and space. Right. So sometimes I would go and spend a couple of weeks with a leader in Germany, mm -hmm. okay, because the leader is in Germany. You can't expect the leader to drop everything and, and come, come and to you, spend yeah. time, okay. So sometimes I'd go to Pune, sometimes I'd go somewhere else mm -hmm. and interact with the leaders in their time and space as they require it. And through that process, uh, a lot of good things happen. And today I think uh, the organization is ready beyond the founders. The organization has a momentum where uh, leadership is, is, is uh, not in short supply. We don't worry about that at all. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, a lot of deep understanding happened about mm -hmm. how overachievers think, work, what are the blind spots. Mm -hmm. uh, because these 100 people were the, you know, the cream of cream the organization. Of and there is achievement orientation and there is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. okay? So uh, when you look at uh, you know, people like them, you realize that uh, they're their best friends and they're their worst enemies. These people don't need an external impetus to do wonderful things, mm -hmm. nor do they require an external provocation to damage themselves. So like this many fundamental understanding about mm -hmm. leadership and achievement orientation among young people mm -hmm. dawned on me and I'm very grateful. So in the process, as much as they took away, I think for me, the takeaways have been absolutely huge. Mm. And, um, you know, today I think that uh, some of the thoughts that I, some of the paradigms that I created, some of the mental models that occurred to me happened because of this uh, opportunity to work mm -hmm. with this top 100 people. Fantastic. And that's actually, that's actually very, it's a very personal experience, I'm sure. Yeah, it's each, very each and every intense, one of them. deeply personal. And uh, so the, the idea was, when you look at 100 people, mm -hmm. I would spend about <coughs> 16 hours a year with them. And look at the, Yeah. So look at the prep Absolutely. time, the travel time, and everything Absolutely. else. Now, uh, it is uh, very intense, mm -hmm. very personal. Sometimes you feel completely drained, you know. Uh, I'm sure it must have been a 
uplifting and sometimes very wrenching uh, experience for them as well. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Um, so my question here today isn't particularly about anything that you spoke about, but I recently read your book Zen Garden, and I'm curious to know the impact that meeting all these phenomenal people and talking to them about things they're truly passionate about has had on you. In short, has writing the book changed the way you perceive things? Absolutely. So Zen Garden isn't my book because it was a series of interviews with fellow entrepreneurs and we defined the, the idea of entrepreneur as not necessarily somebody in business. So the book has interviews with uh, people like Dalai Lama, for example. And then people like, you know, the police officer called B.K. Sharma in, uh, in, in, in Bhuvaneshwar. And of course, the, you know, people like Nandan Nilekanis of the world, and the founder of Wikipedia and all that. Uh, to your question, so this book is their book more than my book. And it was like a fascinated fellow traveler then engages and, you know, has an open conversation and something beautiful comes up. And then I hold it in front of the reader. So that was the... Uh, the, the, the kind of uh, big picture. To your question about did it touch me, impact me, uh, absolutely. You know, I learned many things and I keep you all evening here because there are 70 plus people I met over a period of time. I'll just talk about one, you know. So I had this intense conversation for an evening with a guy who has the dive bar in a fairly seedy part of Mumbai. And this guy, you know, uh, serves beer and whatever else. And uh, a couple of off-duty cops come and they drink and they don't want to pay. And so he says, no, you have to pay. She says, no, you know, do you know who, you know, that classical question, do you know who, who I am? A classical Indian question. So he said, I don't care who you are. You had my uh, food and my, my booze and you were paid. So there was an altercation and these two guys go away and they send goons who then take paper cutters and cut up this guy's face in more than 100 places. So the guy holds his face bleeding and gets into an auto, goes to a hospital. Put yourself in that guy's shoe. In 15 days time he comes back and opens the place. Now, to me, um, leadership, entrepreneurship in life uh, is a deeply personal thing. And it is about persistence. It is about courage. It's about your capacity to hold up against anything. It sounds romantic when you hold up against a bureaucracy. You know, you hold up against, you know, the courts of law. You hold up against whatever. But what about holding up against people who are here to kill you? There is no bigger sacrifice, you know, than your life. And he's a guy who's running in an auto with face bleeding in his hand and doesn't even know he'll come back. He comes back. In 15 days' time, the guy is open for business. So I, I ask him, um, so what happened to the cops? Obviously, nothing happens to cops. Okay. They get posted to another, you know, location. Sometimes they'll get suspended and they'll come back again. So they'll be rehabilitated into some non-uniform mufti job or whatever it is. But he don't, doesn't hold any grudge. And he said, I did what was the right thing to do. I think uh, families, organizations, societies, and nations are built with people who can stand up. And that requires you know, conviction, very deep conviction. So these are things that, you know, was so uplifting when I met these people. Thank you for that lovely question. Thank you so much. I think right. we are good to go I, now. Yeah, and, I think uh, we're... Oh, we there was one question that maybe we should just take, if that's okay. Sure. sure. Sandeep? Yeah, sure. yeah. I wanted you to share, like, you spoke about impact right now. And that reminded me of what I read about you pertaining to time management. Especially the time that we live right now, it would be great if you could just share a short insight on time management. Especially keeping your two by two matrix in mind. <laughs> Which one is that? <laughs> uh, what was the two by two matrix? That was about uh, time and value. Oh, okay, okay. 
So, so to make it a two-minute conversation, Ms. Sushmita is thinking that when will this guy going to shut up? And, uh, <laughs> uh, and her perennial complaint about me is that I speak too much, which is partly true. So uh, our job is to, uh, the two-by-two two metrics is you have time on one side and value on the other side. And our job is to create value uh, over time. You know, how much value can you create over how much time? And within that context, your question was about time management. And uh, I'm not a time management trainer. You know? I've n n people have never asked me this question. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that I think it's... Uh, important to be respectful of time because time is the only thing that we have and it's very important to know that it's a short life so there's so much to do and you need to prioritize things and the best way to do that is at any point in time have a written down to-do list I would <laughs> die without a to-do list my morning you know starts by validating a to-do list I write down actually I physically write down what I have to do and I never, you know, normally people are afraid to do a to-do list because you write down 25 things and at the end of a week you find that only four I have been able to do. And not only those four you strike out and ten more have showed up. But you know what, when you do that to-do list, uh, you tell time that I'm engaged and sometimes you tell time that I'm in command. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, deeply thank uh, PK Foundation, Sandeep, thank you so much. And uh, Ibada is probably not here, but just to thank her for us. Uh, we're quite fascinated with the work that PK uh, Foundation does, and we look forward to learning more and maybe you know, take some of that uh, to other places. So, thank some of the thank, thank you so much. You can have a copy of uh, the book and. Yeah. Thank you, sir. How do you spell it? Yes, I don't see a lot of this. V, no? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Huh, BPS was an investor. Yeah, yeah of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All in the names can be written. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, no, no, I was uh, you know, I that's my yeah i'll be delighted to the session like this again i'll oh. give you my card do yes i'm not getting one as you know you have a in second five. Yes, I So, I'm going to
So, I have Thank you.